So my parents came to visit me in San Francisco, you know, the tech capital of the world. And I wanted to show off this new toy I got. And I just got a Roomba. So if you don't know what a Roomba is, it is an automatic robotic vacuum cleaner. So what it does is it's able to sense your furniture, sense the walls, make them move around corners, et cetera. So I was really excited to show off this very expensive new toy that I'd bought. So I push the button, and it starts. It starts going around my apartment. And then we watch as it runs over my cat's tail, <laughs> as it gets caught on the carpet twice, and bumps into the wall and keeps bumping into the wall, bumping into the wall, bumping into the wall. It's about 45 minutes later. I look at my parents and I'm like, wasn't that amazing? And my mom looks at me in disbelief and says, that thing just took 45 minutes to vacuum your 800 square foot apartment. You could have done that yourself in five minutes with your own vacuum cleaner. And I look at her and I'm like, mom, don't ruin my tech with your logic. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Not Roombas, but artificial intelligence. And this is the technology that we've been hearing so much about. Um, one term that people have been using a lot is, is the fourth industrial revolution. In fact, the World Economic Forum has named an entire institute after this name, the fourth industrial revolution of AI. Another, another stat flying around is that 85% of all the interactions that we're going to have will be somehow moderated or managed with AI by 2020. And that's only in two years, 85% of all the human interaction we have. And it's an industry that's estimated to be worth over $100 billion by 2025. And that's just direct AI investment, not to say um, sort of halo impacts or other industries that will pop up due to AI. But then we also hear some kind of scary things. For example, AI robots are sexist and racist, and that there are ways that we have to avoid racist algorithms. So the AI can do things that are harmful, that are racist, sexist, and just detrimental to society. And then we also see things like this popular cover of The New Yorker, which, was, which illustrates our fear that robots will be so great at what they do that these, this artificial intelligence will automate away all of our jobs and we'll have nothing to do. And this is not just factory jobs. We have doctors, lawyers. There was a popular headline going around about how AI diagnoses cancer better than a doctor. Then, of course, these famous Terminator pictures that are everywhere these days. Um, and in my field in responsible AI, we kind of make fun of it because it's always the first image every article uses when we talk about AI. It's Skynet. So AI, artificial general intelligence, will be so great, so omniscient, omnipotent, it'll come and kill us. So you know, how do we avoid this? How, wh where are we going? It's right? so one common question journalists ask to anybody working in AI is, who do you agree with, Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg? So Elon Musk has tended to take the stance of AI is the most dangerous thing in the world. It is like you know, uh, releasing a demon from a box, and, and it will destroy us all. Um, and, and some individuals, like Mark Zuckerberg, have said, you know, no, it'll be a force for good. So where do we go, and, ha and are we really going to end up in this terrible society? And if so, how, how are we getting there? So we've asked a very similar question in our history. And to understand our future, it's often great to go back and understand our past. And this may be an image that's familiar to some people. At the end of World War II, as a nation, and, and also as a world, we sat back in horror and realized that entire nations of people were complicit in mass genocide. And it wasn't just about electing legally someone into power who had the intent of killing so many people, but it's that entire nations of people also took jobs and positions and did these horrible things. And how, how did we get there as, as, as an entire world? How did we get to that place? One philosopher, Hannah Arendt, sought to answer that question. She wanted to know what was the root of evil in humanity. And she wrote this book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. So she went to the Nazi trials in Jerusalem, particularly one for Adolf Eichmann. And what she noticed, what she commented on, was that what was impressive about him was his mediocrity. We want these people to be these evil genius masterminds. We want, we want them to be fundamentally flawed and horrible people. But what she saw, by and large, as Nazi after Nazi took that stand, was they would say, I was just doing my job. You know, I, I just drove a truck. It was a truck full of Jews going into a concentration camp, but I, I was just a truck driver. 
I didn't, I didn't kill the Jews. Um, I just signed some papers. Yeah, you signed the papers to buy the gas, uh, you know, for the gas chambers. Um, so everybody felt that they were just sort of part of a machine. And, and what was I supposed to do anyway? Because if I said no, they were going to kill me. So it wouldn't have helped. And she called this the banality of evil. And the banality of evil is when we're all complicit in being part of a system and we shove off the responsibility and we say, look, I'm just, I'm just one person. What could I possibly do? What impact could I possibly have? And that's actually what enables evil. Yes, there need to be bad people with bad ideas, but it's enabled by others not taking the responsibility for their own actions. So how does that relate to what I'm talking about, artificial intelligence stuff? So let's, let's revisit those headlines that we looked at, right? And there's one thing that's missing here. Humans. Nowhere in these sentences is the word human or person. And what we've decided is we've decided that this artificial intelligence is real. You would never say, my racist toaster, my sexist laptop. And yet we use these modifiers in our language about artificial intelligence. And in doing so, we're not taking the responsibility for actions for the products that we build. People like myself and my counterparts in Silicon Valley and all around the world. So let me give you an example of how it's happening today. There is something being created called predictive policing. And what predictive policing is, is using historical crime figures to predict where crime will happen. Therefore, you can deploy your police force intelligently. And, and so, so that's the premise. Here's the problem with it. Our criminal justice system is inherently racist. In other words, black and brown neighborhoods tend to be targeted more than white neighborhoods are. And actually, as a social scientist, I will tell you crime, a measurement of crime, is actually not a measurement of true crime. It is a measurement of reported crime and arrests. And guess what? If you send more cops to a neighborhood, they will arrest more. And therefore, it will seem like those are high crime neighborhoods. So when predictive policing algorithms came out, one such individual was asked, well, you know, aren't you worried that this may be deployed incorrectly and you will end up causing more discord in already violent neighborhoods. And he said, look, I'm, I'm just the engineer. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be deployed. I just made it. Somebody told me to. It's my job. They, they pay me at Palantir or whoever the company is. And I just, I just made the thing. You know, what do you, what do you want me to do? I'm just the engineer. So I've coined this term. I call it moral outsourcing. And moral outsourcing is when we anthropomorphize AI. In other words, we humanize it. We say it's racist, it's sexist, et cetera. And we push the responsibility of our actions onto the artificial intelligence. And it's very, very convenient, right? Because we've decided that this AI is smarter than us, and it's better than us, and it can, doesn't need to sleep or eat, and it doesn't worry about its family. It has nothing else to do besides this one task we've told it to do. Oh, and by the way, the thing is racist. So what am I supposed to do? I'm just the engineer, right? So, you know, as somebody who builds this technology actually is kind of convenient because I can build whatever I want and then if good things happen, I'll say, look at the great thing I built and if bad things happen, I can then say, well, tough cookies, uh, the algorithm's racist, right? But what's the problem with moral outsourcing? So let's revisit these two slides. So the problem with moral outsourcing is that's what's creating our fear of the future. When we effectively write ourselves out of the equation, that's why we get Skynet. That's why we get robots taking away our jobs. Because robots don't do the taking away of jobs. People who create them do the taking away of jobs. Companies that implement them do the taking away of jobs. However, we've already started to write the narrative without us included. And then we worry that this technology that we've built will run away without us. Right? So there's clearly a message here for Silicon Valley, for engineers, for product developers, for the Googles and Amazons and Facebooks of the world on what they should do and what we should do. And there's a lot of narrative about that today. You may have heard of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. You may have heard about all the conversation about what's going on on Twitter and YouTube. And that seems like it's just too far removed from the everyday person, right? So, so what, what can anybody in this audience do? If you are not like me sitting in Silicon Valley, if you're not a programmer, an engineer, or even somebody high up in the company, what can you do? Because this talk is about moral outsourcing. What I'm trying to say is that everybody has a role they can play in the development and deployment of this technology to make it better. So the logical question is great, so what do I do? The first question you can ask yourself is, is it worth it? 
So whenever you go online, any action you take, photos you post, pictures you like, articles you read, friends pages you look at, and even, by the way, the messages you don't post. When you write something and you delete it, not even posting it, that gets stored too, because there was a paper about that in one of the biggest AI conferences by Facebook. They've actually stored the things that you've not posted to see what you talk, what you don't end up sharing. Everything that you've ever written or done online is stored somewhere. And even if it's not information that's being used today, companies realize the value of your data and information and they may use it tomorrow. And by the way, it may be something as simple or innocuous as your GPS locations, right? Or your heartbeat, or the number of steps you take every day. So ask yourself, when you take an online action, is it worth it? And you may not know immediately how this data might be used, but I guarantee you it's being stored. So think about that transaction you're making and what you're getting out of it and if it's of value to you. The second, you can train your own algorithm. So we're not passive recipients of the stories that companies are building about us. Because what happens in an algorithm is it creates a narrative about who you are. And that narrative is built on your previous information. So you can actually take actions in your own algorithm to make it better. You may have heard of this term filter bubble. So you get so shown information that these algorithms think you will like. That's how they're optimized. So if you want to see more moderate media or media from the other side, you have to go out and start visiting those websites. And over time, you'll see that your algorithm will start offering these things to you. So you actually can take action to train your own algorithms. And finally, the best way to battle bias in artificial intelligence is to battle bias in the real world. Going back to my predictive policing example, we know the criminal justice system is racist, so we can have fully complete and good data, and you will build an algorithm that is also racist. This is not because the AI is racist, it is because our world is racist. So there are actions one can take in the real world, as some of the speakers have talked about today, that you can do to battle real world bias. And guess what? Then the data that gets picked up is more and more unbiased, and then our algorithms become more and more unbiased. The other half of moral outsourcing is that it's also our responsibility to fix things because we are responsible for the outcomes. So three pretty basic things you can do to create a better AI world. So back to the question that journalists often ask, right? Which world are we heading towards? I reject that because it's very deterministic. They want you to give a binary answer. Oh, we're heading to a great place or we're heading to a terrible place. We are not heading in any particular direction. We are heading in the direction that's a function of what we choose today. So choose wisely. Thank you.